Paleo Runner podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. You can also follow me on facebook.com slash runpaleo or on Twitter at runpaleo. Email feedback to Aaron at paleorunner.org. I wanted to take a minute to tell you about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you sustained energy throughout your workout. It gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates. To get 10% off, use the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening on the podcast app for iPhone or iPad, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Matt Fitzgerald. Matt is an endurance athlete, a certified sports nutritionist, and an endurance sports and nutrition writer. His latest book is called Diet Cults, The Surprising Fallacy at the Core of Nutrition Fads and a Guide to Healthy Eating for the Rest of Us. Matt, it's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be back, Aaron. Matt, so your diet is called Diet Cults. Why did we need a book called Diet Cults? Well, uh, in a sense, we need a book called Diet Cults because the last thing we need is any more diets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, and, and why is that? I mean, what, did, do you feel like there's too many diet cults out there? Are there too many diets out there today that people are trying to follow to gain health or lose weight? I mean, why now? Do you feel like there's more of them now than ever? Or is it just the same thing over and over with things like paleo becoming more popular and even some endurance athletes lately have been trying out low carb? Is it things like that? Or is this a book you've been meaning to write for a while? Well, yeah, all of that. Um, really, it, it, uh, it was inspired by two observations. One uh, is really the mainstream nutrition science community's observation that there is no such thing as a single healthiest diet. For all of humanity. Um, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you have all these popular diets insisting that there is only one right way for humans to eat. They just can't agree on, on what that is. That discrepancy you know, b- between what the mainstream science community is saying and what everyone else is saying was fascinating to me, uh, kind of on a sociological level. You know, I suspected that it wasn't really uh, a debate about facts. Um, I felt that 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 belief that a particular diet, you know, was the only path to salvation, <laughs> was was non-rationally formed. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to explore that, basically, to explore why people have such a hard time thinking rationally about food. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, thinking rational rationally, I mean, that's a hard uh, thing. Uh, you know, not just when thinking about food, but even when thinking about things like um, things you've talked about in the past, like the central governor theory of fatigue or how much water we should drink during exercise. It seems like a lot of emotions get uh, caught up in those. You know, some runners will say, "I have to drink a certain amount every mile," and uh, sometimes there's not a lot of research behind that. But um, what? tell me what the research was like going into this book. I mean, you must have read a lot of different books about diet fads out there. Uh, were you pulling your hair out by the end of it, or what was that like? You know, I, it's funny. I, I took a slightly different approach. Um, you know, I really don't read many popular diet books uh, precisely for the reason you hinted at, because they make me tear my hair out. I just, <laughs> I just can't do it. So I, I mostly get... I dive into those books you know, when I have to on an as-needed basis, but I really prefer to inform my own perspective on diet from, from different kinds of, of reading, different kinds of experiences. Um, and in, in particular, particularly with this book, what I really didn't want to do was carry out the battle on the same field it, it's been warred, warred on you know, between the factions, the existing factions. You know, it's always... Well, what about this study? Well, what about that study? And and it, it never leads anywhere. So mm-hmm. I wanted to write a book that that included um, a lot more of real world evidence uh, that in, induced uh, injected uh, common sense and wove in this concept of uh, critical thinking as a complement to knowledge. Um, and so it, when you read the book, it's probably not what you expect. You, you would probably expect it's just going to be a survey of you know, different popular diets where mm-hmm. I just bash each one. <laughs> That's not what I'm really doing. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to teach people about a phenomenon that I believe exists, um, this, kind of, this kind of diet cult instinct that, that we all are potentially susceptible to, where we just, you know, we, we decide that there is only one true way to eat, and we, when we dive in headfirst, 
Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we evangelize and maybe become a little bit pushy trying to <laughs> get everyone around us to eat that way. That, it's a book about all that stuff. So there's a lot of narrative in there uh, where I have, you know, tell the stories of real world people who have you know, gone through this type of journey. And I, you know, I weave the science into that. But um, it's just, you know, so the research was actually a blast because I wanted it to take me in exciting places that were really transformative uh, for me, because I wanted it to do the same thing for readers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Matt, you talk a lot about that real world experience. And you mentioned how a lot of times there'll be different studies that come out and one shows one thing and one shows another. And part of the allure of something like a paleo diet or any of these diet cults, as you call them, is that there's some kind of guiding principle behind them. You know, we tend to think that uh, uh, if we follow a paleo diet, then there's some sort of evolutionary principle behind it that can help us achieve optimal health. So break that down a little bit. Um, you know, for example, I had Dan Lieberman on the show, and al although he's not a paleo diet eater, he talks about some things like avoiding too much high fructose corn syrup because, you know, our liver hasn't evolved to process that. Do you think that there's any evidence behind some of those claims? Yeah, well, on a, on a very general level, I totally agree that it's easier to follow a path of healthy eating if it's based on principles versus, you know, just granular specifics of knowledge. Um, it's kind of Michael Pollan's perspective where he tries to boil down everything into seven words. You know, if these seven words are all you need to know to eat healthy um, because you, you can just lose the forest for the trees and get confused if you, if you treat each food and each nutrient as just an isolated case, you know, should I eat it, should I not, you know, what disease does it cause, what disease does it, does it prevent. Bringing things up to the level of general principles uh, just makes, makes it a lot simpler um, you know, your, your diet may never be perfect that way, but uh, as I've suggested, there's no such thing. And, and it just makes it a lot more practical to, to eat healthy, whether it's mm -hmm. paleo or, or another way. Okay. So I guess, I guess, uh, it sounds like you're kind of agreeing with that. There are some principles that if you follow them, it makes it easier but at the same time, it sounds like you're saying you don't necessarily need to follow a principled diet. I mean, what, what are, what's the differences between, say, a, a paleo-style diet versus agnostic healthy eating, as you call it? Let's, um, maybe let's get into some of the, the specifics. Um, for something like a paleo diet, a lot of people avoid grains. Um, what, would your, what would the mainstream research that you've been looking into say on whole grains? Well, the... You know, the the, the mainstream nutrition science community's uh, consensus on whole grains is that, on balance, they are health-promoting. You know, that, that if you add them to your diet, chances are you will, you will get healthier. Mm -hmm. That is not my opinion. That's, you know, that, that is close. You know, it's not an absolute consensus, but it's, there's a plurality of you know, people with PhDs working in nutrition science departments at major universities, that that, that is the case. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't mean you have to eat them, um, but that, you know, again, I'm not the one doing the research. And that's, yeah. sort of, that's sort of a big part of all this is. It's, you know, everyone's got an opinion, and we're all, almost all of us are lay persons. So what are we really doing? We're not doing the research ourselves. We're, we're actually just choosing our favorite experts. There's a lot of bias that goes into that. Um, a lot of, um, you, you know, you select your experts and you come to believe that, that you eat what you do because of what that expert says, but you chose that expert. And, and it's very easy to show that most of the time we choose our experts based on pre-existing biases. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we've already decided which path we're going to go down and then we just line up, you know, the gurus that help us. <laughs> sustain sustain that belief. So what I do is, you know, I, I encourage people to be very self-aware when choosing their favorite experts. Um, you know, I'm really turned off by people who, who, who scientists or pseudoscientists who seem to clearly want to believe what they believe. To me, that's not what good scientists do. I, I like a dispassionate, I, I, I think style really matters. Again, if you're not the scientist yourself, you, you, want, uh, you, you want your gut to tell you that that uh, these people are trustworthy. And that's why I really do base uh, 
you know, my sense of what is true about diet on the mainstream nutrition science community. I think it, mm-hmm. it's safest by and large to, to go there first. Okay. So I, the, the main message that I got from reading your book was that, um, you know, you really don't have to go to extremes if you want to live a very healthy, um, life where you're losing weight, getting to a healthy weight. You don't have to cut out things like grains or do anything special. You can basically just follow the guidelines that we've been uh, taught to follow for, you know, the past 50 years, something close to the food guide pyramid. Um, what would you say to people? What do you say to people who say, "Well, there's an obese obesity epidemic, and um, following the food pyramid obviously hasn't worked, so we need to try something different." It, is uh, is there any truth to that, or, or what's your opinion on that? Well, I, I don't pay much attention to the the, the pyramid. Um, my approach to it is really, uh, let's ask this question: What do we really know? about the rules you can't break with diet if you want to be healthy. Now, again, I'm going to mainstream nutrition science to answer that question, and that's the same place the pyramid comes from, but the pyramid has so much baggage attached to it at this point. And Mm. um, so I I just just, asked the question, what are the real musts? You know, if, if you take all the diet cults together, they're all throwing different musts at you. You know, you absolutely must eat this. Oh, no, no you absolutely must not eat that. Mm-hmm. Well, behind all that, a lot of those musts aren't really musts. They're not scientifically supported. Um, so agnostic healthy eating is just an attempt to clear away the clutter and say, you know, here, here's what I think we ought to be able to agree on in terms of what, what, we, what we cannot get away with dietarily. And so you have a broad framework um, of, and I, I base it all on food types versus nutrients. I think that's, you know, again, you lose the forest for the trees. So the, you know, I just think that there are higher and lower quality food types um, and you'll, you'll do well to eat more of the higher quality ones, less of the lower quality ones. Uh, but you, you certainly can eat them all. They're all, they're all food. Even Skittles are food. Um, just not a food you would want to eat a heck of a lot of. Now you were going to get into the uh, the the why is there an obesity epidemic? Don't we need to try something new? Um, I've been talking for a while, so I can let you <laughs> ask that again, or ask a different question. Or yeah, or well, that. you know, a, a lot of people. Uh, let's let's take for example, Tim Noakes would say, you know, I've had him. I I just talk about Tim Noakes because I've had him on the program a couple of times, and he he'll say things claims like, um, you know, a. Uh, a low fat dietary guidelines as promoted by the food pyramid. And I'm not saying that you're necessarily promoting this, but, um, haven't been working. And so you need to try something different. He, he tried something for himself, which is a low carb diet. And that seemed to work for him. Um, is there, is there, I think you're saying is there's really no truth that you need to go to extremes. And what would you say to someone like Tim Noakes who says you, you absolutely need to, uh, shy away from, things like grains or the food pyramid, if you're having trouble with weight and you can't keep it off, you need to try something more like what he's doing is, I think what you're saying is there's really no evidence for that. And something more moderate would have worked as well. Is that basically? Yeah. Yeah. He, he is an outlier. And and the the type of research that I I put more stock in, um, demonstrates that In, in the book, you've read it. I talk about the national weight control registry which is like the real world biggest losers. It's a research population made up of several thousand men and women who have lost at least 30 pounds and kept that weight off at least one year. Mm-hmm. So it's just a group of people who've actually already succeeded in what you know we're trying to solve for everyone else. And when the diets of those people were analyzed in search of common patterns, there were none. <laughs> So people in the real world who are succeeding in losing weight and keeping it off permanently are not following any one diet. You know, that's all the proof you need that there is no one true way to do it. You know, otherwise you would see, you know, a very strong trend. And you do see some very strong trends in that population of successful losers. They're they're just not diet trends. They all exercise a lot. They all weigh themselves very frequently. And they all eat very monotonously. Whatever their diet is, they really limit what they eat. And I think it's simply because uh, it's easier to control fluctuations if you're always eating what you know worked for you in the past. 
All those things to me are, are signs of a, just a very high level of motivation uh, to succeed. So I think you know, I come down believing that motivation is the, the true secret to weight loss and not, not discovering the only diet that can possibly work for you because the facts are right there. Uh, literally dozens of different diets work equally well. It all depends on how motivated you are when you go on it. Mm. And you you talked about the National Weight Loss Registry. What about things like, aside from just losing weight, um, achieve, a lot of us want to achieve optimal health or optimal performance. Um, so we want our bodies to be as healthy as possible. Is Obviously, weight loss isn't, uh, it's just one factor as far as, far as health is concerned. Are there th- ways that we can eat to achieve optimal health other than trying one of these uh, diet cults? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there uh, in the book I use um, as kind of a, an imaginary cohort, the, pop- the, the greater population of high-level endurance athletes. Here's a study that needs to be done. We, we need to come up with some way to score overall physical health. It would just be a battery of tests that looked at, you know, fasting glucose level, total antioxidant capacity, um, body fat percentage. You get where I'm going with this? Mm-hmm. Just like maybe eight tests you could take and they would give you an overall rating of your health. So it would be, the study would be exactly what has already been done with the National Weight Control Registry, but just looking at health instead of weight loss. So you create the score, you put 5,000 men and women through it. And you rank them from you know the, the healthiest quartile on down to the least healthy, and then you analyze their diets. And I, I'm utterly convinced that if you took you know the top 10 percent of people, men and women who scored highest on this battery of tests, that their diets would be all over the map, just like they are for the people who've lost weight. That you're you're not going to find that. Lo and behold, it was invisible to us, but all of the healthiest people are on the paleo diet. No. <laughs> It's just, it's just not the case. So again, that, that sort of, it's science, but it's relevant science. Mm -hmm. You know, we get so caught up in our microscopes that we forget what's relevant sometimes. And this is all supposed, it's almost like trying to win a war in a laboratory. It's like, I'd rather just fight the battle and and decide that the the army that wins was the better army. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the same thing is true when it comes to eating for health. So it so happens that in my work as a sports nutritionist, I have, I have had the privilege to analyze the diets of a great many world-class endurance athletes. And guess what I've found? Their mm-hmm. diets are all over the map. Mm-hmm. If there's a plurality, uh, if there's any kind of trend, it is a trend of agnostic healthy eating where very, very few elite endurance athletes are on any diet that has a name. Very few vegetarians. Uh, I, I'm, in raw numbers, yes, but as a, as a percentage of the total, very small numbers are vegetarian, very small numbers are, are paleo, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Most of them just eat like a normal American or Canadian or Swiss or whatever they are. It's just they have very high quality standards. So you don't see a lot of sweets. You don't see a lot of fried foods. Most of the grains are whole grain. You see a lot more fish than meat typically. You know, you look at these food journals, and at first you're like, oh, it's just a normal day's eating. You, you'll have to look a little closer, and you'll see, well, no, actually, that's a really healthy normal day's eating. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's been some, uh, I don't know if you'd call them studies, but uh, definitely not clinical studies, but showing that, like, endurance athletes seem to have some possibly higher levels of heart, heart disease, or heart, not heart disease, but heart attack risk. Um, what do you make of some of those studies? Do you still consider endurance activity one of the best uh, and healthiest activities around? Well, it's like anything else. It, you know, uh, it's, it's very stressful. I mean, not aerobic exercise generally, but the kind you do when you're training for Ironman triathlons and, and, and marathons, not just the training, but the events themselves. I mean, they're brutal. You, you do this stuff and you know it, you know, that you're really testing your body. And, you know, overall, you, you, it's very healthy. We know, we know that, but could, could it could it just wear you out over time? Mm. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm. Um, it also wouldn't concern me at all. You know, you, you could you could tell me tomorrow that running causes cancer, and I'm not going to stop running because that's <laughs> I I don't run to live to be 120. That's just that is not how I live my life. I I'm trying to add life to my years, not add years to my life. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that being an endurance athlete, it, I know that being an endurance, endurance athlete is a great way to add life to my years. You know, it's my birthday today, as you noted. Uh, I'm 43. You know, I still get carded when I buy alcohol. I take pride in that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I look a lot younger than I do. And that, you know, mid 40s is kind of an age where there's this bifurcation where people who aren't taking care of themselves really start to look and feel terrible. And people who have been taking care of themselves can still get carded when they buy alcohol. Um, so, you know, I could well, you know, keel over when I'm 86, which in this day and time is old, but not super old, where someone who exercised moderately and otherwise did everything else the same way I did is going to live to 112. I don't care. And maybe when I'm 85 and knocking on the door, <laughs> I might ask for to change my mind on that, but I'm not so sure because, you know, I see, I see former endurance athletes in their 70s and 80s, and they still look and function really well. They just may, you know, have less sand left in the hourglass than someone who went at it more moderately. But that's this is all very philosophical and, and mm. my perspective. Mm. I'm not I'm not telling anyone else what they should think about it. Right, right. Um, Matt, if you don't mind, I'd like to get into some of the more specifics. Uh, a lot of our listeners are paleo style eaters, and I know that you've said before that you could still be a paleo style eater and have an agnostic approach where um let's let's a lot of people who eat a paleo style diet ha, are not afraid of saturated fat things like coconut oil avocados and butter on an agnostic style eating approach would those be acceptable fats to include if you're an uh, an endurance athlete yes i mean th- those are all categorized in, in what one way one way or the other as high quality foods again with the agnostic health eating everything it's just there are 10 types of foods and then any specific food you eat would be slotted into one of those categories. So butter is dairy. Dairy is a high quality food type. So there's a thumbs up on that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's you know as far as saturated fat goes, um, that's something that where where do you come down on that? Is is that? I is, don't pay attention to it. Okay. It's really it's um you know we talked about principles versus uh, you know. De- the detailed nuts and bolts of, of nutrients earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I pause at the level of foods and okay. don't get into nutrients. Nutrients, I'm not concerned about. They, they mm-hmm. take care of themselves. Um, so you know, if you eat a you know a whole natural food, whatever's in it is good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if it, if it's saturated fat, fine. It's a whole natural food. Mm, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I really like that approach. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about sugar water. There's a chapter on sugar water and as endurance athletes, you know, when we're running a marathon, there's tons of sugar out on the course. And I suppose, uh, someone like, uh, Tim Noakes might say that that's a terrible thing, but your take is a little different. And, uh, tell me about what you, what your take is on sugar for endurance athletes. Well, the purpose of that chapter, Sugar Water, is to highlight how th- there's, a, there's a tendency in, in, within the diet cult mindset to view foods or nutrients as either absolutely good, good in any amount, good in all contexts, or absolutely bad. You know, something that can never be useful in any situation whatsoever. It's, it's black and white thinking. And I, I have this chapter where I talk about the history of sports drinks to, to, to subvert that way of thinking. Water, which is one of the two main constituents in a sports drink, is pretty much considered good, right? Mm-hmm. Now, who's who's going to say water is bad? But I give the example of the Gatorade Doctrine, which in the 70s and 80s and 90s encouraged athletes to believe that dehydration was deadly and that they should drink as much water or preferably, preferably Gatorade as possible. Um, to stave off dehydration. Well, this ended up killing uh, one runner, more than one runner, but I talk about one in the book. Um, so it's an extreme example, but it goes to show that, guess what? There, you can even have too much water. Like, no nutrient is absolute, absolutely good. None. Um, and sugar. So sugar is basically, it's got a bad reputation, especially now. And I wanted to use the same example to show, no, you know, even sugar can be beneficial in, in certain circumstances. There, there's no nutrient that is absolutely bad. Um, and so sugar has you know, one particular use, aside from the fact that it tastes good, 
um, is that it enhances endurance performance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How about a, a lot of people lately are interested in this lower carb style of endurance training. I, I had a guy on the program, Zach Bitter, who set a 100 mile rec American record and he follows a low carb diet and he attributes that to part of the reason why he can use fat better because uh, uh, if he teaches his body to burn fat, I guess he doesn't have to uh, take in as much glucose during the race, uh, something along those lines. So what, what can you say to people who are interested in this lower carb uh, style of eating? Is it completely bogus or is there any evidence to that? Well, uh, I, uh, somewhere in between them. I, I think it, I think it is a case of trying to fix what ain't broke. Um, you know, there's, if you just were, if you just came down from Mars, this is your first day on earth and you wanted to know about how to fuel yourself for endurance. And you just went and looked at the scientific literature to educate yourself about what you ought to do. You would be highly motivated to make use of carbohydrate, <laughs> both in training and, uh, in competition. And I think, you know, very honestly, Aaron, what, what's going on here is that people are starting with the premise that carbohydrate is bad, that God made this terrible mistake when he made our nervous systems run on glucose, and that we need to fight back against this error of, of God or nature in every way possible. So, so to me, it's just, it's, um, it's, it's a false premise, and it's um, ideological, so then, then you have to come up with science and practices that make the whole house of cards keep standing when there was really no reason to go down that, that path in the first place. What does interest me about this, I mean, so as an athlete myself, I'm not going to take that kind of risk because the research, the pro-carb research is just too solid. Mm. So I, you know, I'm not going to risk my career that way. And it's very, it's very worth noting that at the elite level um, in Olympic sports, um, you don't see anyone doing this. You know, mm. they're, they're, they're not going to take that kind of risk. When there's real money on the line, they're not going to play around like that. Mm. Um, but I am very curious, because I'm a curious person, to see where it all goes. And you know, I, I, I absolutely don't doubt the testimonials. You know, when people change their diet to a high-fat, you know, low-sugar approach, and they get results that they're very satisfied with, you know, that gets my attention. And I and I, I, I like to think of myself as an open-minded person, so I would like this process to continue to unfold and um, unearth some things that maybe you know, inform our, our, our picture of, of what's possible or, or what might be better in different uh, types of situations. I don't know exactly where it's all headed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, uh, gluten-free eating, uh, you have a chapter on that, and, and it's become pretty popular. I've had some people on the show who say that you know, giving up gluten has really helped with things is not just losing weight, but things like autoimmune conditions. One guy uh, had a pretty severe autoimmune condition of his heart. And by giving up gluten, uh, he was able to, his doctors verified that his in inflammation had gone way down, even though he didn't have celiac. Now, do you, what do you think of these sort of testimonials of people who have given up gluten and feel better? Uh, do you, is that is that just a passing fad or, or is there something to that? Well, it's certainly not science. You know, it doesn't it doesn't meet that standard. You know, when it's your life at stake, you know, you're not going to give two bits about science. Sometimes, you know, I mean, you can't wait for the you know the guys in the lab to figure it out. You you need to find relief for yourself. So, you know, I celebrate it whenever someone figures something out for themselves. Uh, Often, uh, I mean, lots of things can happen. There is a, a placebo effect that is well known to occur with all kinds of diet changes. Mm. Um, also, people can get relief from a particular change and actually misattribute it. Um, in that chapter um, on gluten in the book, I talk about FODMAPs. You know, mm. this is kind of difficult to digest carbohydrate that's in a, a weird, seemingly unrelated collection of different fr fr fruits and vegetables. And one study found that 92% of people who thought they were lactose intolerant actually got no relief when, when uh, that's said lactose, right? Yeah. Gluten, yeah, I mean, gluten intolerant. 92% of them got no relief when, when gluten was removed from their diet independently of the removal of these FODMAPs. Mm. Uh, so what, what it turned out to be the case was that they were having, they were ha their symptoms were caused by FODMAPs, not gluten. 
But when they made changes to their diet and got relief, they said, well, consciously what I was doing was removing gluten. When in fact they got the relief from another nutrient that had been removed from the diet, so that's sort of, that's why you have to be careful with the testimonials. the The results are great; you're happy for the person, but it doesn't necessarily forward science when when that kind of thing happens. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, so y y people, you say in the book that basically like a second grader can know how to eat a healthy diet. Basically, all the evidence is already there. Could we just run through maybe a few of those uh, guidelines that you put forth in that last chapter of the book as far as you've got fruits and vegetables near the top of your healthy eating guidelines? What, are, what would be some other uh, healthy things to include in, in a well-rounded meal, someone who's looking to um, increase their health, maybe lose weight, and not go to extreme to one of these diet cults? Well, maybe a good way to make this concrete would just be to tell you what I eat. Yeah, let's do that. Um, and, let's do that. And again, um, a, a big part of the diet cult impulse is to get the whole world to eat the way you yourself eat. Um, mm -hmm. That's not what I'm trying to do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is just for illustration purposes. So I do follow generally what I call my agnostic healthy eating approach, and I have a particular way of um, of doing so. Um, so uh, for for breakfast, almost every day. Get ready for this. I, I have a bowl of cereal, grains, <laughs> a big bowl of grains. Um, you know, when I was younger, it might have just been, I don't know, Honey Nut Cheerios. Now I'm, I'm super selective. It's always whole grain, low sugar, um, and I'll have it with organic whole milk, and I'll uh, load a bunch of berries on it. Um, mm. So that way I'm getting three what I consider high-quality food categories, um, and it certainly works for me. I, I know that... Um, whereas, you know, I, I, I do believe that whole grains are healthy. I know that they are, um, a food type that nobody needs mm. and that some people really are better off without. But if I had never learned anything about nutrition science in my whole life, I would have no reason to believe that whole grains weren't perfectly healthy simply based on how my body responds to them. Mm -hmm. So I do eat a lot of a lot of grains. Again, almost all whole grains. So yeah, it's a big big bowl of uh, cereal in the morning. And do you eat that pre workout or post? I, I am not someone who can work out first thing in the morning. When I wake up, there are two thoughts on my mind: food and caffeine. Um, <laughs> and so I take care of that first. So my first workout of the day usually comes at about ten in the morning. Okay. And breakfast I eat before six in the morning. Okay. So that, that's that's breakfast, and then a typical lunch. That's where I try and mostly load up on vegetables in one way or another. If I might have um, a, a big salad or I do a lot of vegetable soups because it's just a super convenient way to just slurp a whole bunch of veggies down your throat. Um, I also am a big fan of V8 because uh, it's, you know, yes, it's not a whole fruit, but it's juice from, I mean, it's, it's juice from vegetables. It's, it's you know, just... I call it, I give it like a half a serving's worth okay. <laughs> in, in vegetable scoring. Um, I'll eat a lot of leftovers um, uh, because the thing is a lot of conventional lunch foods are not, they don't have a lot of vegetables in them, like a sandwich typically. Mm -hmm. So leftovers from dinner is often a good way to get more vegetables. Um, and then in dinner, usually my dinner is, is paleo by some description or another. I, I eat a lot more fish than meat. Um, I don't think meat is bad, but I think most of the meat available to us actually is not very high quality. Um, okay. So I, I'm, you know, my wife and I just bought a bunch of bison because we, when we do eat meat, we prefer something that it's more like something we would hunt. <laughs> okay. And is, um, that and fish, no is that fish wild caught that you eat, or just conventional? Yes, whenever possible. Um, you know, I, I keep, I keep. Um, I keep my eye on some of the, you know, the vetting standards that the industry uses to let customer consumers know about, uh, you know, mercury levels or other contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, so I avoid, for, for example, Atlantic salmon because uh, it's supposed to have all kinds of nasty stuff in it. But yeah, mostly, and again, it's not the least expensive way to eat, but yeah, and, and most of my vegetables are, are organic. I, I have a backyard filled with fruits, fruit trees, so most of my fruit. Uh, I'm not afraid of fruit. I think, you know, fearing the sugar in fruit is one of the most ridiculous missteps in the history of diet cult craziness. I mean, it's a piece of fruit for crying out loud. So I've got seven fruit trees in my backyard, almost never have to buy fruit. So yeah, a typical wow. dinner would be paleo by some description. It would be 
you know, piece of fish, a bunch of vegetables, maybe fruit for dessert, and of course, a square of dark chocolate. Nice, nice. How about alcohol? Yeah, so I'm I'm pro pro alcohol. Again, you know, that's another one of those things where, you know, it's nice to have principles, but <laughs> alcohol is something that's been in the diet, you know, only several thousand years. It's not not a not a pre paleo it's not a paleo food, right? right? But I mean the research is absolutely clear on it that in moderation it's it's one of the healthiest things you can put in your body. It's not food, it's more like a medicine, like a, a supplement to food. Nobody has to drink alcohol. You're fine without it. But I happen to, you know, like beer, um, so I would drink it regardless. But it is nice to know that the research shows that it's heart healthy as long as you don't go beyond two a day. Okay. Okay, Matt. I'm also curious about uh, your writing process because you you keep a pretty uh, steady output of articles on competitor online, and you're you're constantly writing new books, uh, interesting things. Um, what, and you said you get up very early, what kind of things are you doing to keep up that steady output of, of writing that you keep up on a yearly basis? Well, I've been doing this all my life. Um, you know, I was always going to be a writer and the more you do something, the more efficient you get. Um, and I'm also just a creature of habit. Um, I, so I, I love writing and there's, there's nothing I would rather be doing you know, five days a week from nine to five or whatever. Um, and I, I am efficient and also I'm, a, I'm an ideas factory. I've always got, you know, five or six books I'm dying to write, but mm. I can only do one at a time usually. So you put those things together and, um, oh, and one more, I have no children. So, okay. uh, children take up a lot of time. So I have <laughs> my, the time I otherwise would be, uh, uh, playing catch in the backyard with my kids. I can devote that to writing as well. Okay. Are, are you just capturing all your ideas in like a Word document or do you use specific tools to help you get your, you said you have like five ideas going at a time. How do you keep track of all those? Uh, they'll, they'll gestate in different ways. Sometimes I'll just think about something for a while. Um, it, writing a book is a, a major investment of time, blood, sweat, and tears. So I don't make the commitment to start until I have uh, a sense of urgency about it. And so sometimes I, I won't write a thing until I just can't get an idea out of my head. That's what happened with diet cults. Um, mm. You know, I just, uh, I started having this kind of perspective on what I was seeing out there, just all, a lot of this tribalism uh, and a lack of critical thinking. Um, and And I couldn't shake it. And I felt like, uh, the last thing I want to do is just write another diet book to me, like that's that's a fate worse than death. Is to say something that someone is already saying. If I say something, it has to be readers have to say, you know what? I've never heard anyone put it like this before. And you have to admit, with diet cults, that's you know fundamentally what I'm doing there yep. is adding something new. Whether you agree or disagree, I am adding something new to the to the conversation. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's the way it usually works. And then even then, once I've decided I want to do something, I'll often take many months to play around with it, do research, write very short pieces that, that um, you know, uh, manipulate aspects of the argument I want to make. Uh, it's all really, I do it by instinct. Okay. And how about your running? What have you, what have you been up to lately with your running? All right. I, I don't want to jinx it because um, I've been, I get injured all the time. It's, it's rare when I'm healthy enough to, to train hard. And I, I've had a hip flexor tendonitis issue for more than two years now that has mm. seriously curtailed my running. But lately, it seems to be all right. I'm doing uh, about an hour at a pathetically slow pace every other day of running and then supplementing with um, bicycling, lifting weights, other stuff to keep me from going stir crazy. So cross your fingers for me. I hope to actually be able to race sometime before the year is out. Great. Are you still a fan of uh, minimalist running type shoes? I know you used to wear the Nike Freeze and even the Vibram Five Fingers quite a bit. Yeah, the the, the Vibram experiment didn't work well for me. It was it was it was an ill timed experiment because I was working on brain training for runners at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I mentioned them in there, and this is pre Born to Run, by the way. <laughs> I was I was early, I you know 
it wasn't there wasn't even a bandwagon then. Right. So I wrote about Vibrams in the book, but by the time the book was out, I had stopped using them because it was it ended up being a disaster for me. Okay. But I still do like I like you know very light, uh, low profile shoes. But I have just I have discovered that I, I do land heavy as a runner. Mm. Um, I've had that tested, and I, I've always felt more comfortable in shoes that, although light and low profile, kind of have a, a little cushion, like a, even a little bit of a mushy sort of feel to them. It just you add those elements together, and that seems to be the shoe I do best with. Okay, so I, I I'm thinking right now the Skechers Go Run is kind of a mushy shoe. What shoe are you running in right now? Uh, right now I'm running in uh, the Brooks Pure Connect. Okay. Cool. which definitely fits that description. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, it was great talking with you, with you today about your book and uh, kind of bringing a new perspective to the whole issue of diet and, and nutrition. And I just want to thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you a lot. And uh, for all your listeners, um, this is not an anti-paleo book. I think, you, <laughs> I think you would agree. It's not, it's not, it's not pro or anti. Um, and uh, there's a lot in there besides discussion of, of paleo. So uh, if you're curious, I, I give it a chance. Yes, yes. I, I definitely second that. Matt has a lot of great stories in there um, from elite athletes to um, just different different studies that he's looked at and, and come to this agnostic style of eating, which uh, I think is a, a pretty rational way to go about it. So yeah, thanks for putting this book out there, Matt. All right. Thanks for the time. If you like podcasts, you're also going to like audible.com. There's over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Go to paleorunner.org and click Audible at the top of the page to get your free audiobook download. If you're listening to this on the podcast app for iPhone or iPad, click the link displayed on the app right now. 